Hello and welcome to everybody that's joining us today on our session relating to gastrointestinal stromal tumours. Uh, my name is Helen and I'm a sarcoma specialist nurse by background uh, and I'm now part of the Sarcoma UK support line team. Uh, and with me today, I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ramesh Balusu, who is a consultant oncologist and the network GIST lead for the team in Cambridge. So welcome, Dr. Belusi. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Helen. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And so I guess the, the kind of key reason we're doing this is, is trying to get some information or more information for people that have recently been diagnosed with a GIST um, or information for their family and friends, because we know that a lot of people that are, are diagnosed with a GIST or any form of, of sarcoma probably haven't even heard of it before. Um, and I think one of the, the key things for us on the support line is making sure that people have, um, you know, relevant up to date information specifically for them. So can you just explain, um, Dr. Beluso, exactly what a GIST is? Okay, so what is a GIST? GIST is a very rare mesenchymal tumor, meaning soft tissue tumor um, arising from the digestive tract. Uh, the incidence of GIST is uh, 10 to 15 per million. So in UK, we expect to see between 600 and 900 patients per year. Uh, so being a rare cancer, I'm not surprised that most people have not heard. In fact, even the GPs and the physicians uh, working in hospitals or in the community may not have heard of GIST. So GIST is a rare reason kind of tumor affecting the digestive tract with the incidence of about 10 to 15 per million. And in fact, though it is rare, it is the most common sarcoma. Uh, so from the statistics point of view, the rare cancers, it is more common than other sarcomas. Great, thank you. And and we know that, that GISTs can um, affect any age group. Um, and so, you know, we do really see a, a, a varied group of, of patients by age, don't we? Yes, that's correct. Majority of the GISTs we see are in the age group between 50 and above, 50 and under 80 years, that kind of uh, age group. But we do see uh, more uncommon GISTs under the age of 40. And often they tend to be a uh, different subtype of GIST. There are about 15, 20 different subtypes we know now. So just as a whole, uh, as you rightly pointed out, can occur at any age group. That's very important to remember. Though they're more common in the age groups between 50 and 80, but they can actually occur in any age group, including children. Absolutely. And I think one of the differences with the GISTs compared to the other sarcomas is the the specific genetic mutations within GISTs. Um, and why is knowing those kind of really important for the clinical teams? That's a very good question. Uh, what we know about GIST is, GIST is a paradigm for um, what we call as a kinase-driven cancer. So if we rewind ourselves back to, say, 1990s, 1980s, we didn't know much about GIST and they were called something else. So the term just was coined back in the mid 80s and uh, the whole thing unfolded around late 90s, early part of the century when uh, the Japanese investigators uh, found out there was a mutation, an activating mutation in one of the genes called KIT on chromosome 4. And that led to discovery of a, a tablet which was at the time known as STI571, which is now we know called imatinib. And that changed the, uh, the outlook and the uh, understanding of the biology and the treatment completely. So just is a very rare, unusual type of tumor, which is driven by a specific mutation inside the tumor, not in the patient's normal cells, inside the tumor. Uh, and this mutation drives the tumors to multiply. And this mutation can be in a gene called KIT, K-I-T, or another gene called PDGFRA, which is a less common type of uh, mutation. So if you find a mutation, then you have an appropriate treatment for that particular patient. This is very different to other sarcomas. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the key things, isn't it, with the GISTs, that we do have very specific treatments um, for the GISTs that we unfortunately don't yet have for some of the other sarcomas. And I think 
you know, one of the, the key things that, that we get quite a lot on the support line is the fact that we want people to be cared for within the specialist centres. Um, and we know for some people that does mean, you know, quite a distance of, of travel um, to the specialist centres for certain people. But why is it so important for us to get people treated by the specialist teams? Again, fantastic question. Uh, without any doubt, I, I've been treating just for nearly about 18 years now. Um, what we have learned is the more expert uh, expertise you gain, the more uh, tailored service you can give to the patient. And um, just being very rare, 10 to 15 per million, an average oncologist in this country may see only three or four just per year, and that's not good enough to us to gain the expertise. And the pathology of GIST, meaning under the microscope what they look like, and also the molecular profiling, meaning the special genomic testings we do, and the radiology, meaning the interpreting the scans, and the type of surgery we do for these patients are highly specialized, individualized uh, interventions. So. These have to be centralized and these have to be done in a specialist center to get the best outcome for the patient. So I actively discourage patients going to smaller uh, hospitals, no disrespect to the oncologists who are treating there. I'm actually working in a small hospital apart from Cambridge, I also work in Bedford Hospital. So I make sure that my patients come to the GIST clinic or a sarcoma clinic where there's a specialist expertise available for looking after these patients, both from the clinical point of view uh, interpreting the scans and also getting the best out of the pathologist and the molecular uh, uh, phenotype, etc. Absolutely. And we very often, um, you know, speak to people um, on the support line and, and really try, if they're not in a specialist centre, to really encourage them and, and advocate for themselves to get to a specialist centre. Because we know, um, don't we, that actually getting into a specialist centre does improve outcomes. And so we know how important that is. Other important uh, member of the team we always remember is the clinical nurse specialist who actually works with the oncologist and the rest of the team in the multidisciplinary team to make sure that you have a specialist nurse looking after you and being acting as a liaison person between the team members. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we know the importance of the clinical nurse specialist and, and how that link actually into the teams is crucial, I think, to, to for people to know that you know, what's going on in the background is actually happening. Um, and, you know, we know that people can't automatically get, um, you know, contact with their oncologist directly, but knowing that there's somebody as their key worker within these specialist teams um, is really, really, really important. And we, we, we often actually um, ask people if they've got the, the contact details of their specialist nurse, and, and if not, then to ask them, because we know that the specialist centres do have them um, and the difference of the support really that that makes to the patients is, is really important. And you've already mentioned about the different members of the MDT. Um, we, again, very often speak to people about the importance of waiting for an MDT discussion to happen. Um, we know that for people, you know, once you've been told you've got a, a cancer diagnosis, you just want to push on and you just want things done. But can you kind of explain the, the real importance of waiting for an MDT discussion to happen and, and what influence that has? OK, um, the way it works is that the just often patients come in from different hospitals, could be a small hospital, a uh, district hospital, for example, and they have had an endoscopy, a camera examination through the esophagus into the stomach, and they found out there's a tumor sitting there. And the images are sent across to the cancer center, and uh, the biopsies, if they're done locally, again, they come to the cancer center, or we do the biopsies ourselves in the cancer center. The importance of the MDT is to make sure that we have a plan tailored to the patient. So that's the most important thing. There's no one plan for all patients. There's no kind of one. Uh, so it is a, it's a multidisciplinary plan tailored to the patient. Is the patient need to be followed up regularly without any treatment or the patient requires an operation right now because the gist is bleeding or is getting bigger or does the patient require uh, imaginary or tablet treatment first before we go for an operation? 
or the tumors are already spread into the other parts of the body, how do we manage this patient? So all these decisions have been made in a centralized MDT with all the important team members being present so that everybody can contribute and give their opinion. It will be consensus decision about what is the best for the patient. Absolutely. And I, I think you're right. And we very, you know, often I, I say this a lot, but we, we speak to people um, about the importance of individualized care in sarcoma because we know that people with the same subtypes don't always follow the same pathways. And so it's really important um, that the teams do things on an individualized basis. And you, you mentioned there um, about for some people, if their gists are, are smaller, we sometimes do um, a follow up on those without any treatments first. And we know that that almost brings about alarm bells for some people because they're like, okay, well, we know it's there. We know it's a cancer. So why aren't we doing something? Can you just explain why we do that specifically with the smaller gists? Right. That's again a very, very important question the GIST community always asks me when I uh, give lectures. So often just can be found by chance that the patient is being investigated for something else and there might be a small a one centimeter or 1.5 centimeter tumor sitting there in the stomach. Uh, when we see these patients with these small tumors, and first thing we do is we confirm this definitely a gist. So it is very, very important. You do not assume that what you see on endoscopy or on a CT scan is a gist unless it is confirmed through a biopsy. So we confirm it's a gist, and also what we do is we do the molecular sequencing, meaning trying to find out the genotype, what is driving this tumor. So in the stomach, this is exclusively in the stomach, it doesn't apply to other parts of the digestive tract. We know that some of these just can be very indolent, meaning they're very slow growing or not growing at all. And then what we do is we have a discussion with the patients, the family, show the pictures and say, this is what it is. This is a chance finding that it has happened and this is unlikely to grow, or if it's going to grow, it's going to grow very slowly, and make sure that they understand what we mean by that, and keep them under surveillance, and if the tumor starts growing, or it starts causing the symptoms, then we can operate. So if, as long as we make sure that the patients and the family understand that we're not actually abandoning them, we're actually monitoring them very closely with either CT scans or endoscopy, or endoscopic ultrasound, the, this is the important message we want to get across to the patient that small sub two centimeter gist can be carefully monitored and the appropriate action of whether operation or anything can be done at the right time. Absolutely. And it's really about information, isn't it? And making sure that patients and, and families really understand why those decisions are made. Um, and, and I think that your description of, of why we do that is going to be really helpful for a, a huge number of people that are hopefully watching this. And in terms of the other treatments, you know, you, you've mentioned surgery, which I guess will depend on exactly the location and, and the size of the gist. And so there's there's lots of operations that we could do. And so we don't really want to get into every single type of those. Um, but I think one of the, the key things as well with gist is the tablet treatments that we have, which I think for, for GIST is, is unique in sarcomas because we don't have those for many, many of the, the other sarcoma types. And one of the key things we get asked about is the common side effects of these treatments. And so I wonder if you could just touch perhaps on, on some of the most common side effects for, for people that may be taking the, um, the tablet drugs. Okay, so what we have right now, the drugs which have been approved and licensed are three drugs. First drug is called imatinib, second drug is called sunitinib, and third drug is called regorafenib. Imatinib was um, approved by NICE way back in 2004, so that was nearly 18 years ago. And imatinib is a relatively safe drug and well tolerated. The indications for imatinib are patients who have metastatic gist, meaning the tumor already spread beyond the organ, and they have a imatinib system mutation in the tumor, then they have imatinib as long as the tumor keeps responding. Then the second indication for imatinib is what's called adjuvant imatinib, meaning the patient's tumor has been taken out, and the tumor is supposed to be high risk for 
to, to not coming back in the future, and they get three years of first imatinib, which is a standard of care everywhere in the world. And the third indication of imatinib is what we call as neoadjuvant, meaning prior to the operation, if the tumor is fairly bulky or requires major organ section, what we do is we give imatinib prior to the operation for about six to nine months, shrink the tumor, and make the operation much more easy and hopefully much more conservative type of operation, meaning that we don't do multi-organ resection. So by and large, you might think it's very well tolerated. There are side effects which are mostly temporary, puffy eyes, watery eyes, fatigue, sometimes diarrhea, muscle cramps, um, joint aches, dry skin, but majority of the side effects are temporary and well tolerated. There are very rare side effects, including liver dysfunction and sometimes irritation or inflammation of the lungs, but these are extremely rare. In contrast to that, the second line and third line treatments, similar to regrafenib, are a bit more toxic, meaning that there are more side effects, including high blood pressure, uh, ulcers in the mouth, diarrhea, fatigue, hair changes, and sometimes uh, affecting the heart. The, what we've learned in the last 15 years is we tailor the treatment to tolerance. Mm. I use what's called five T's, tailor the treatment to tolerance or tailor the tyrosine kinase inhibitors to tolerance, meaning you have a plan with the patient and the family. What dose can you handle? What schedule can you handle? And you stick to the dose and schedule and also empower the patient to take some days off if they're not handling the drug very well so that they don't get into a situation where they get severe side effects. So the secret of managing patients with just in the any line, first line, second line, third line is making sure that patients understand why they're taking the drug, making sure that they understand what are the side effects, how to be one step ahead of the side effects so that we can monitor the side effects very, very closely and then act appropriately by changing the schedule or the dose and empower the patient, let them make the decision, so they can make the decision if, for example, come Friday they're getting side effects, they can take our days off and then restart the following week. So that's what we've learned in the last 15 years, that you have to empower the patient so that they can actually make decisions about their drug dose and drug schedule so that they can manage the side effects more effectively. That's brilliant. Thank you. And, and I guess one of the key things is if somebody is, is out there that started these um, treatments and are having side effects that are that are getting tough is to be in contact with their clinical nurse specialist and, and get that information back to the team so that that discussion can be had. That's very critical. They have to have direct access to the team looking after them and also not wait until the, uh, next week or a week after. They need to contact the specialist nurse and the oncologist straight away. By the way, I'm getting these side effects. What do you think I should do? and never ever get to the stage where the side effects are so terrible that you have to stop the drug. Yeah, That's yeah. very, very important. You have to be proactive and you need to be one step ahead of before they get into what we call as a significant toxicity, what we call grade three or grade four. We want to identify them early toxicities, grade one or grade two, when the toxicities are mild so that we can actually intervene and actually do the appropriate things. Absolutely. And and I guess one of, one of the other things um, that we hear quite a lot is that people feel kind of isolated once they get um, a GIST or, or sarcoma diagnosis. And so the, the support networks that we have are really important. Now, obviously, for us at Sarcoma UK, we've got the Sarcoma UK support line um, where we're happy for anybody, um, the person with the diagnosis or friends, family, the general public to contact us with any questions that they have. And we've got um, support groups um, locally as well. And one of the other um, areas of support is just Cancer UK um, because they can put people in contact from a peer-to-peer -peer support um, point of view. And I think that that is really important, isn't it, for these people that, that get a less common cancer diagnosis? That's correct. I mean, rare cancers are challenging, not just for the physicians treating them, but also the patients and the families. And um, the support in the community is vital. Uh, very, very important for them to be part of uh, a bigger group and also the peer support they have from the other patients. And just cancer, we can start doing a wonderful job in this country. And the, most of our patients have are members of the Just Cancer UK, and we meet with them in the uh, six monthly meetings in different parts of the country. And often they ask questions which they would not be able to ask their oncologist. And we have the platform for them to express their views and also 
to clarify what's happening. And uh, this is a great work you guys are doing, both just cancer and cancer community. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. And, and Dr. Belusa, we really thank you um, for your time today. And, and we hope that people will find this conversation useful. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Bye now.